Welcome back, everyone. And we are here at Access to Perspectives Conversations, talking today, today with Maureen Archer, who is joining us from the United States and is the president at Professional English Incorporated, a consulting firm with um, who specialized on technical writing, scientific writing, science communication at large, and also um, like Maureen is also passionate as far as I've heard from her and also seen in action about English as a second language. So non-native English speakers helping people to learn the English language in a way that's fun and engaging and also um, to make everyday tasks, but especially the professional context and um, arena enjoyable. And so, yeah, dig into the language as it was your native tongue eventually. Welcome, Maureen. Thanks for joining the show. Thank you so much. It's my true pleasure to be here. Great. So to give you a, a little bit of background about Maureen, she received her PhD in English Linguistics from Purdue University and has been teaching for about a decade until she founded her own company, which is now Professional English Incorporated. Um, she is a subject matter expert in communication training and technical editing and specialized, as mentioned, in supporting non-native English speakers. Um, since, uh, yeah, in doing so, she's helped thousands of professionals from around the world. And she's also a course designer and instructor, personal coach, professional speaker, and a technical editor. Um, we've also co-facilitated a short training on technical scientific writing for an, a mixed audience, which was quite fun. So it's really enjoyable to have you here. I'm glad that we know each other and we, we can inspire each other in the work that we do in supporting scholars and researchers in the work that they do and the yeah the the work that every researcher eventually has to do and might not come as easy which is scientific or technical writing exactly um, no, it's been a lot of fun working with you so far and i look forward to it in the future yeah thank you so much so starting which um would you like to share with us what got you to like about like which points in your vita made you decide to eventually brand your own company and do the work that you're now currently doing with particularly non-native English speakers and also to serve the scholarly community in technical writing. Yeah, oh, definitely. Yeah, happy to share that because like with anyone's background, it's a bit twisting and turning in times. You know, I had um, since I was young, I always wanted to focus on English because for me, languages are like puzzles. So I grew up doing puzzles. And so to um, get into words and how they're associated and, and their um, connotations and denotations and how they fit together and how you can change them to um, create even different meaning, it just, to me, it was like a big playset, you know, something, something very fun. So I knew I wanted to go into that. And then I discovered, oh, I could do that at a high level and help others with it. So that's why I wanted to go into college teaching. So I was very much focused on becoming a professor at the university, uh, which I did. Um, and then I was a professor for, um, you know, seven or eight years um, and, and and then I uh, but how, unfortunately I found it a bit of a toxic environment at times I have to say the the politics in academia sometimes were um, a bit challenging and I was also the writing center director I started a successful writing center at the university and as the director I would receive calls from outside of the university from businesses that needed help with their um, native Chinese executive, from people who wanted help for their cousin who was coming to visit. So a lot of need I found was out there. So I realized that there was a business opportunity to help those whose English skills are too advanced to take classes and who really need the, the specialized focus to help them with the profession that they were in. So I started professional English um, and uh, really just to focus on helping non-native English speakers to um, be more effective in their professions. 
But then so many organizations said, oh, can you come and teach classes in writing and presentation skills and cross-cultural communication? And so it kind of blossomed that way. But it could be in part because of where I am in Southeastern Virginia and the fact that we have a very large research network here. We have one of the NASA facilities. We have some large research facilities that are just in this area. And so the need was very great locally. Um, and also I come from a long line of engineers. And so I'm very much focused on, you know, the construction, the um, structure, the, you know, so very much how the pieces fit together. And so that's how I teach. That's how I talk. And that very much fits in with those who are doing technical writing um, and scientific research. So um, it seemed like a natural fit. And I am so excited when I get to help those who are doing amazing things in the world. You know, mm -hmm. those who are producing the new research, the, uh, the latest developments, and to be able to help them to effectively communicate the brilliance, you know, the results that they have come up with. It's just a joy. And so that's kind of how I, um, where I am after 23 years in professional English is um, the fact that I'm able now to kind of more specialize in this area because it is a passion of mine. Great, yeah. I mean, looks like, first of all, you live in a hotspot of researchers where, where there's plenty thereof and they all need mm -hmm guidance and support i i also like myself being a non-native english speaker but giving courses in scientific and technical writing to researchers and when i had native speakers in the class they all told me like we we need to learn the same things because the spoken english be it american canadian south african kenyan whatever is so different from the technical writing style mm -hmm. um and yet of course learning a second language or in many people's cases a third or fourth language because um, many people i know have, before english they've learned two or three other languages and then there's also the saying the more english you speak the easier the the, what? the more languages you speak the easier it gets to learn another one but mm. it's still a challenge an extra challenge be it alone for the vocabulary um, so what do you say, or what did you see in how the coursework that you provided and engaging with um, the students or the participants of your courses, um, what was it like to observe them and um, to, to make those steps forward in understanding the language and finding the right words to express themselves in their research as well? Like, can you yes. recall like one or two examples mm -hmm. how that came about is that maybe difficult to grasp also because it's in some cases a longer and in other cases a shorter process I imagine oh yes yes and people have different skill sets within language some people pick it up very fast and some people it's a real struggle so it depends if it's a strength you know, happen. and, you know, different, you know, everyone's different uh, in that. One of the reasons I enjoy coaching so much is that I can really focus in on exactly what someone needs. And that's especially important at the higher level that when the more advanced um, mm -hmm. English speakers, because, um, you know, when, when everyone's kind of beginning, then you can teach the general stuff. But then as you get uh, more advanced, then you're like, oh, yeah, then there's maybe a particular pronunciation or maybe there's a particular grammar um, uh, thing that you know, that particular person has. Or it could be a category of vocabulary mm -hmm. that we need to fill in, you know, or we need to reinforce. So now there are some things that I found are across the board for those who are um, more at the higher level um, of um, English speaker, and that is idioms, you know, mm. or phrasal verbs. These are, you know, very much a challenge for, for um, many at the, the higher level. And I understand because I have some um, reference books. One has over 10,000 American phrasal verbs. Yeah, it's just daunting. So what do you do with that? Well, most of us will use the same terms 
again, again, you know, so once you have, um, let's say a list of 20 that you use fairly frequently, then you can become very um, focused on those. And I always recommend that someone keep a language journal. Yeah, so that, you know, that's yeah. really nice, especially in your field, because then you're going to hear people, and especially with your colleagues, especially if you have those who are using certain idiomatic phrases over and over again, you know, it's like, oh, what is that? So you write it in your journal, you look it up, and then you, you know, try it out. So. And learn to use it and apply it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There. So, yes. Yeah, so for um, those, you know, more advanced in their fields, that's a really nice thing is to get a coach um, or to have a colleague uh, who's a native speaker and who you want to emulate, someone whose style you like. Um, you know, if you can work out some kind of partnership with them, yeah, to help each yeah. other. And remember, it's got to be mutual because I know many of the native speakers here in Europe, they are mm -hmm. overwhelmed by the requests. So can you just quickly correct this for me for the English? And, mm -hmm. you know, it's fun if you do it once or twice a month, but and that's already a lot. Mm -hmm. But at some point, it's just too much <laughs> and people need also to do their own work. Um, but yeah, but maybe find a way to... Yeah, to balance that the workload that you put on other people and yet also seek help because those who most people will be willing to give help um mm -hmm. or to find a way like a mm -hmm. like a mutual beneficial kind of co-working um agreement where both part yeah both win and you can reward them with you know cooking dinner once a week or something <laughs> Yeah, that's very good. That's very good. When you do ask someone, even if you could just ask them to mark what is not clear, just what is not clear or what maybe if there's a grammar thing or two, because there are patterns. And once we learn the patterns, then we can um, move you know, to, to correct them. The, um, the other thing is, is to get practiced at, at proofreading and editing your own writing. And one of the rules that I think works so well. One of the strategies is to read your own writing aloud, mm -hmm. to read it out loud. And a lot of people do not. So um, it really helps in that, first of all, it helps you slow down. And to hear it, you can kind of listen for repeated words. You can say, wait a minute, is that right? So you kind of, instead of having it in your brain, because we often read what we assume we have written instead of mm -hmm. what is really on the page. So yeah, you know, that is one of those golden rules that I like to to pass along. So if you haven't tried it yet, I definitely recommend that they try it. Yeah, yeah, I agree, and I I do that sometimes, not for a full mm -hmm. article, but it's it's definitely useful. And mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, I've learned in school, but like coming back to this exercise or step in the workflow, really, um, to read out loud. What's the difference between written sentences and spoken sentences? Because you wouldn't write a speech as you would write a research article, right? Ah, that's a very good point. Yeah. Yeah, there's, there's some strategies. If you are writing a speech, then you realize that the people are only listening. So it's a matter of being a little bit more deliberate with saying something and then repeating it a little bit to add more details and then having to, so the transitions are often even more important when you're writing a speech because you, if, if they are bombarded with too many things that aren't connected, then they start not listening because mm. they're confused. So to create a very clear line to help them stay with what you're, so, and now the next example of this is this. And so now if you have slide presentation, it makes it easier because they can see. Yeah. Um, the and you walk them through as you speak. Yeah. Exactly. Oh, however, I'm glad you mentioned um, speeches because um, I, I always like to tell people that when they get the adrenaline flowing, it's very good to purposely slow down a little bit with your speech, mm -hmm. especially if you know the listener is not used to your accent. So to slow down a little bit, off and also you will it's very common for those who are in positions of power and leadership to speak a little more slowly so you also convey that that professionalism 
So to slow down, even though the adrenaline has kicked up, <laughs> it can mm. be very good. Yeah, for all concerned. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. And then is it like what I ref was referring to earlier that also native English speakers have troubles with technical English is because they, li they like to insert and some more than others, but they like to insert descriptive words as you would do in prose writings. Mm -hmm. And technical writing doesn't call for that as much. You want to focus on the science. And yet we need our brains like storytelling. So how can researchers balance not to have it too technical, but still comprehensible in a way that storytelling and our ancient way of transferring information would be served to make it easy to comprehend? for anyone to read really but also leave out all the unnecessary words and just keep them mm. the necessary amount of unnecessary words from a technical point of view so yeah. good yeah, question I mean, yeah yeah very good question and it's one that um i would say that's in the editing process mm. um, when and they say the best research writing papers are a story yeah. so you know what you know what is the, what is the setting of the story why did you know what problem are you trying to solve and then the steps you go through to do the research and the results so it's kind of has that natural storyline to it so the first draft or the first two drafts that would be what i would focus on but then the idea of the style and the conciseness that's when you go through and you really look for that mm. um and that's something that um I think is skipped a lot of times, especially since we're very busy and oftentimes we're rushing to get mm -hmm. the, the paper written and submitted. But you're, you're the professional editor for the pre, um, publication will be very happy that you have taken the time to go through and really look and see, are there ways to make certain sentences or certain uh, entire paragraphs just a little more concise for the reader? Because oftentimes readers will skim anyway. Yeah. And so you, 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 if it is too, as I like to say, muddy, you know, this is too much, too many words. So I, I wrote an example down. So instead of in this paper, the data are presented to show the results. You can just say this paper presents. Mm -hmm. So it's a matter of going through and really looking at, is it, is it possible to say this in fewer words? Yeah. yeah. And, and that's a, that's kind of a muscle that you know once you start working it you know it's mm. easier to do and then many people also struggle with oh i'm supposed to squeeze my findings into i don't know eight thousand words only yes. and that seems impossible at a point but it's actually not if you stick to the essentials mm -hmm. and yeah rephrase um, make it more concise and yet coming back to mm -hmm. the storytelling from what I've seen and observed, and also it's it's hard to actually do it for me and myself, but it's easy to spot in other people's works. Um, yeah. So uh, to use words as assist that assist our brains to to understand it better, like you know, like we would read a whole story, like connect connecting words mm -hmm. between sentences to mm -hmm. like for also unconsciously often for our brains to allow to see the connection between one sentence one meaning and that sentence with the other what's coming then mm -hmm. and then sometimes it might be good to use words that also pass along a passion or motivation of your mm -hmm. own why you do this in the first place why this is important to you mm -hmm. and why it should matter to others mm -hmm. and because we are still humans as researchers as much as we want to do technical writing I personally think it doesn't mean that we have to strip off all humanity from it. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. yeah it's... Maybe I think examples for that could be from what I've seen. I mean, it's difficult to come up from the top of my head, but there, I mean, instead of like, I don't mean to be, um, uh, to, I mean, of course, we want to convince people of the, the rigorousness of our results, but also why we think this is important, why it matters, mm -hmm. and and their words to express that. Mm -hmm. So to yes. also give it like a slight emotional touch to 
right have you have you seen that or would you agree with that to a certain degree i i still yes. I'm trying yes. to find an example i'm sure we come up with at some point in this discussion but yeah even something small like surprisingly yeah the results already, should, like we didn't yeah, expect that a, to happen and here yeah we yeah so that wow there's a little bit of the the humanness in there mm. um my thought on all of this is yes you want to convey the humanness and yet still be professional and polished without being you know too whoopee whoopee mm. you know about things no, of course yeah, just, we um, still want to be serious about uh, yeah yeah topic yeah. and it's all and respectful Mm -hmm. and yet we can also show that we're excited about the findings I, because I think matters. that's great yeah yeah and I would recommend um, people to go and read you know read the articles and and to um, see how what they do that find an article that you think wow I really enjoyed reading this hmm. and then go back and say why did I enjoy this what was it about how they told their story that hmm. made it interesting what words did they use how did they structure it? And so to get to use our researcher brains and analyze it, yeah, you know, so then we can emulate it. Yeah, and exactly what words they use and made us feel a certain way about the research mm -hmm. and how it was communicated. Um, yeah. And also one other thing that's very nice is to, when you have a certain publication that you want to publish in, is to really read several articles in there to see mm -hmm. what the editors and the publishers are publishing. Yeah, mm -hmm. what is it that they are looking for in an article so that then you can, you know, provide them with the kind of article because different publications have different focuses and different um, things that they're looking for, even different styles. Yeah. yeah, they also have author guidelines nowadays, many of them, not all, which, which is mm -hmm. certainly a way to or a, a page to check out. Yeah. I also point off like always in my scientific writing courses to that. But despite that, you also I from is it what I hear what you're saying, um, not only from the formatting point of view, but also the style, which might not be as obvious and as descriptive in the author guidelines. Exactly. Yeah. And because some and yes, I that's a wonderful piece of advice. Definitely get into and find the editing guidelines, authors' guidelines, authors' um, recommendations, you know, th they're called different things, but mm -hmm. to get into the website and pull those up, because they are often very specific, even things like use of passive voice. There is no mm -hmm. um, push, I think, to add more of a human uh, touch, too, is to be to use um, the active voice as opposed to so much passive voice. So, yeah, because that's also what I've observed and heard many people complain about that technical writing sounds so dry and boring and you really have to kind of switch your brain on to yeah to be able to understand what's actually written yeah, yeah. and that's often because or when I teach like or when I ask students and participants in my courses why don't you use I did this we did that whatever like whoever did the work but make it explicit it's not yeah. some random ghost in the lab who did all the work, some bits yeah. or whatever, so you have to use passive voice. That's for the methods part. Mm -hmm. There it matters what was done and how it was done, but the rest of the all the other sections should be active voice with some passive voice in between where it makes sense. Yes, it, I agree. Mm -hmm. I think it comes to our um, writing naturally. So this mm -hmm. goes back to what you suggested like just write down as it comes to your mind and then edit and then read it out to you again to make it all sound um sound really <laughs> to make it sound nice and compact. yeah yeah that's excellent advice and what there's another trick for self-editing is as you are reading it out loud if you are stumbling over your words that's a good place to go back and revise if you are having difficulty reading your own writing chances mm -hmm. are someone else will too <laughs> so, yeah that's very nice oh and it reminds me you had asked a question about what's the difference between speech and writing you know uh, in speech we are making constant performance errors you know it's very rare that we will start at a particular sentence and then keep going and and you know even what i'm saying right now if you were to type it out it looks very disjointed mm -hmm. so um yeah and it's for some people, though, to get over their writer's block, they will just talk. 
out their paper and then either just have it typed in because now we have that technology, of course, mm. or to go back and listen to it and put it into complete sentences as they want. So, mm. yeah, it's a strategy for getting over writer's block sometimes. It's just yeah, a talk. Like there's also this um, trick I learned and now um, pass on is that if you don't know what to write, just write exactly that. I do not like just get your brain and, and hands to work. Like get them to work and then the flow will come and bring the science your things into it that's a great yeah that's a great writing technique yeah to <laughs> to get over writer's block yeah and also to um oh i had a series um i don't know if you saw about procrastination um in, the, in the, my linkedin um post and one of those is just to break it into smaller pieces you know if you're overwhelmed by oh no now i have to write this all out into a paper just start with something small yeah. yeah, maybe okay, I'm just going to write out my methodology section. It doesn't have to be in the order of the paper. You know, mm -hmm. they actually say to do the abstract last, you know, so to so you don't have to write the introduction first. You can start at any point and just get it start to get it out. Yeah, or sometimes it might be good to start with the abstract just to get the plot there to start with and you can still tweak it but it's right that you should do the last polishing things you should do on the abstract and then actually the title very last. Yeah. Yeah. whatever but sometimes it goes the other way around also there's no rule of thumb it's just a guidance kind of thing that people yeah. find useful. oh and also if you're struggling to write a paper it may be because you are trying to put too many ideas in it i've i've worked with so many researchers who they're just like oh I just, it's so hard to do this paper and then we get into it and i say what is your main purpose what are you trying to convey here and they say well i want to convey this and this and this and I said, well, that sounds yeah, like three, yeah. three papers. That's three papers. And so then it's like, oh my gosh, if you start to pull it out and say, I can publish three papers. And I was trying to all put it together into one. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so that idea of, you know, just kind of looking at it from a distance as well and identifying what is the purpose of this paper? Mm. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a key message. And it shouldn't be more than one really. And then maybe two or three uh, accompanying results that support the take-home message yeah exactly um, yeah so well good and and then also showing it to someone someone you trust that knows what they're doing and you know just ask them this you say could i make this into two papers and they might say sure or you could just do it this way or here's my thought and yeah to, to get some help from from your friends Thank you. So um, in the preparation for this episode, I also ask you a few um, questions, which were meant as icebreaker questions, just to get the flow going. And also <laughs> it might be fun to, for, for our listeners to hear um, from you and others who are here with me in these conversations. Um, what's your, so let's start with one. So who is the researcher that your life um, that you find or found inspiring? And you mentioned George, is it Lakoff or Lakoff? It's Lakoff, yeah, George Lakoff. Yes, he's a cognitive linguist. His book, Metaphors We Live By, mm -hmm. was one that I used uh, both in my master's and PhD research because I was so fascinated by it. I thought, oh, it makes so much sense that there are these large cognitive metaphors that we use to understand our world and that um, we hear in our language all the time. Mm -hmm. Like one he uses is time is money. So how are you spending it? How you, you wasted it? You know, there, so we tend to, especially for abstract parts of our lives, we use concrete things. And so, so he would identify all of these conceptual metaphors that we'd use. And I thought, oh, that's fascinating. So my dissertation research was on the conceptual metaphors we use for language teaching and language learning. And the whole idea of someone is speaking broken English, which I never liked that term. I thought, oh, that's terrible, broken English. So that's the idea of you need to fix mm. their English, as opposed to learning English and you'll have natural ways of growing and your and your English skills will develop. So, you know, there's different ways of, you know, approaching teaching and learning based upon the metaphors that you understand and use for certain categories. So from my so. understanding, language is never a status quo, it's always evolving. 
and it's continuously being influenced by non-native English speakers who come and you know inspire the majority yeah. to adopt one or the other word either yeah yeah um so yeah, yeah. I, that well, reminds me of the song by Marion Faithful, Broken English, but I really never went into the lyrics of that one. No, no, I don't know this one, yeah. Oh. Well, it is, that that point is so good and never failed to aggravate the teachers that I would, the future teachers that I would teach in college, because they wanted to be grammarians. They wanted to know how to do it so that they could always teach it that way. I'm like, I'm so sorry, but language is always changing. You need to get, you know, you need to, yeah, yeah. Well, they say if enough people make the same mistake, it becomes the rule. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, okay. That's yeah. Change yeah. To think about. If, if enough people take out the uh, Oxford comma and people decide they don't need the Oxford comma anymore, they stop using it. Or if enough people stop using whom correctly, they don't know how to use whom. The teachers don't know how to use whom. So guess what? We don't use whom. <laughs> you know, so, yeah, it's language is always changing. That's what I find fascinating about yeah, it too is, but yeah, that infuriates those who really want to keep it the way it used it. Well, when I grew up, I learned it this way. That's nice. Uh, good for you. <laughs> and things are changing. <laughs> well, come to new well, and that's why I think we get resistant sometimes to yeah. those who learn that, hey, I've got to write in the passive voice all the time because that's what yeah, scientific writing is all about. Say, no, thank goodness we are changing. So it's it's more enjoyable and easier. It's actually easier to read if it's in the active uh, voice. Yeah, I also don't know where this came from because I think in like 30 or 40 years ago, researchers were much more passionate in their writing and it was much easier to comprehend and read really. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And then at some point, some people hear the change became mm -hmm. a paradigm. Um, some people started not has to be um, rigid and, and technical and leave out all the words that are distracting or seem distracting and was and then it's difficult to actually yeah to understand doesn't matter if you're a native speaker or not because it's too technical and it's not accessible for, for our brains really yeah, yeah and this is what i also try to point out like it doesn't have to be this way just because you see that's most of what you see doesn't it's not written anywhere Mm -hmm. And it might have been one or two editors in one journal who made this a rule and nobody else did, but then everybody complied or most people would comply with that rule. It's funny. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. It was the middle of the last century when we really started getting that coming through very clearly as scientific writing needs to be passive. Mm -hmm. And now any book you pick up about scientific writing will say, it's Please. not, it doesn't have to be, <laughs> yeah. Please, don't. Please stop, Please stop. Yeah, because especially with the amount of writing that's out there, you know, mm -hmm. you just can't read a lot of it. And it is quite frankly, if a reader picks up your, your writing and your writing's all in passive and it's all really hard to read, they are not going to read it because mm -hmm. it's just too much. So it is a benefit to our listeners that if they write in a style that's easy to read, mm. that's going to be that people are going to read their their material much better. Yeah, I could yeah. talk on forever and we probably will. Like we could um, sure. very likely continue with this conversation in future episodes. I would be so, happy to. Yeah. Thank you. So, yeah, watch out for Maureen on this on this channel. And thank you so much for your time here today. And yeah, let's see what we can do together. Maybe you'll also see some course announcements to sign up for where Maureen and I work together to yeah, work with you through your research writing hurdles to make them fun and enjoyable. And um, yeah, that's what we do. <laughs> My pleasure. It's been a great fun. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. Okay, see you soon. All right, bye-bye now.